What's going on, everyone, and welcome back to the Midwest Outdoors podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jim O'Neill, and this show is brought to you by Fish Daddy. If you guys haven't checked them out yet, please do. There's some incredible baits on there and some of your old favorites and some with LED technology that you've never seen before. But hey, we've got a full show today, so we got to get right into it. As always, we start with the news, and guys, all my bass fishing fans, we, we're over. It's already over. Of course, we got the opens to stay tuned to, but the tours, the pro tours are over. Um, a couple weeks ago, the MLF finished up. Michael Neal got the win over on the uh, St. Lawrence River. And the St. Lawrence River, let me just say real quick, is so fun. Um, I, I don't care if they go back there every year. I don't care about the hate about forward-facing sonar debates. Don't care about any of it. When you get to watch anglers just catch four to six pound smallies just left and right, and you know people are breaking the century belt in Bassmaster, I mean, you're in for some good days of fishing, and it, it is fun to watch. I, I don't care what anyone says. Big brown footballs are amazing. Um, so Michael Neal won on the M MLF stop, and then fast forward a week or two, Bassmaster was out there, and they had some nice conditions to start, but boy, did that water get rough. We even saw some people puking, which, you know, normally you don't see these guys who spend most of their life on the water throwing up, but that just tells you what kind of conditions they had. Again, guys, we're not a bass tournament show, but I mean, where do you start with this tournament? There's drama all over the internet and on TV. Now, you know, you had a race for Angler of the Year, um, that went down to the second to last day. It, it there was a lot going on, you know, especially spots. And I'll I'll put that in the comment section real fast, guys. Before we finish this up, what do you guys think? Everyone has spots, right? Everyone has a home body of water. Everyone has a home pond, and unless you physically own it, right? Do you have rights to a spot? Are you allowed to say because? you found a spot 10 years ago and have won a tournament or won some money on it or made that lake even popular because of what you did there, do you have the right to think that that spot is yours? I don't know. I'll leave that up for debate. You guys comment on it. But um, yeah, that was, that, was some that was a heated debate over there with the Johnson brothers and Robert G. But that leads us into... Chris Johnson, who won Angler of the Year. Um, again, it was an unbelievable finish for Angler of the Year in Bass this year, one of the more captivating uh, races in the last few years. And Trey McKinney finished up second. Without that day he got disqualified from, he probably wins Angler of the Year. So he might be kicking himself, but hey, Trey, Keep your head up, Trey. You did win Rookie of the Year. It's a nice little check, good little accolade. So congratulations. Now, speaking of the Johnson brothers, um, Corey Johnson actually won, and he took home first place, 102 pounds of smallmouth. Um, again, love seeing the century belts. So congrats to Corey and to Robert G on the century belts. Robert, friend of the show, friend of mine, buddy, hey, Four top 10 finishes, um, one heck of an end of the year there. I know you're so close twice there. It's going to happen. Just keep your heads up. It's going to happen. And a shout out to Jacob Fouts too, you know. We had him on the show before the year really got going here, and he had a lot to prove, had a lot of naysayers, and a top five finish and in points. Um, incredible ending. So to all the anglers, congrats, and to all the fantasy fishing fans out there, all the bass fans out there, we will see you guys next season. I personally cannot wait. Speaking of records, guys, it's one of my favorite parts of the show. We get to truly look and talk about fish that bend the mind, you know, really create the desire to go fishing because after all, I think that's my favorite thing about fishing is not knowing what happens on the next cast and the fact that every cast could be not only your personal best, but a record. So let's get into it. In West Virginia, there was a big catfish caught. There was a 46.7 pound channel cat, largest channel cat I've ever seen, caught by John Tyler Rutherford on 
wait for this guys, a little Barbie pole, a little kid's pole with probably preloaded six pound tests on it, makes the catch so much more impressive. You know, you're just catching little bluegill and all of a sudden that behemoth eats. Um, so congrats on that awesome fish. Um, then going out west is the Wyoming tiger trout new record. And that was caught by a young man at the mere age of 13 years old his home lake, Lake Viva, and he caught a 12.77 pound tiger trout. Um, never caught a tiger trout. You know, they're pretty common out west in the mountain areas, but it's limited, the region you can catch them. But they're really pretty. I hope I can catch one one day. I'd be happy with a two pounder. So congrats on that big, big tiger trout there, Jackson. Now, we're not done with the records, but because this is the record show, we need to talk to some people catching records. So we are going to start with a Midwest record right in our backyard. And this individual hasn't only caught one. Nope, he has not only caught one record, but he's caught two records. And they're both the same fish, but not the same species. So join me as we talk to Kyle Hammond about catching the Indiana state record gars. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. everyone well hey we are going to start off our days and our interviews with like i said our first new record holder and he's not new to records though he's already secured one a few years back and that's mr kyle hammond how you doing kyle good how are you doing today jim you know we're doing good um as i always say wish wish we were on the water instead of here in the office <laughs> but absolutely uh, we're doing good. Um, again, would do a little better if uh, we we're getting our name etched in the record book, but we'll leave that to you and our guests that we're talking to today. But, um, you know, I, I was just filling in everyone. You already caught um, the short nose gar a few years back, right? And mm -hmm. now last month, the spotted gar at nine pounds, uh, what, 11 ounces? Yep, that's correct. Nine pounds, 11 ounces, which is a nice fish for a gar, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now I, I read, I was reading a little description of that day, you know, and what was going on. Um, now you caught on a fluke and that, that kind of came out to me a little bit because I, I'm a bass fisherman, you know, have my mm -hmm. whole life and, um, it's great bass bait, great pike bait, the fluke, but I don't think about it right away when I think about gar. Um, but you, you're the gar master. So inform us a little bit. Were you targeting gar that day? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm big into gar fishing. I think they're a lot of fun. They're definitely an underutilized species that not a lot of people even think about trying to fish for. Um, so yeah, I was out targeting gar on this day. And uh, I've been targeting gar pretty seriously about four years. And ever since I started fishing for them, I was trying to come up with the most effective way to actually catch them. Because um, if you don't know too much about gar, their mouth is almost solid bone with just a little bit of muscle around there. So there's not a lot for hooks to get into when you're actually trying to hook these fish. Um, so like I said, I've been trying to develop a way to hook them. And some of the most effective things that I've found is, again, they're, they're fish eaters. So, you know, some kind of fluke or something like that that imitates a fish is a perfect way to get them to bite. Um, but what I've developed is actually kind of a rig that I've never seen anybody else use. Um, so what, I, what I've got is basically just a split ring. And onto that split ring, I put a little tiny plastic keeper, you know, like the kind of the coily, um, coily looking thing. 
you basically take that soft plastic and you screw it onto that plastic keeper to kind of hold it onto that ring. And then the other thing I do is I hook a really teeny tiny razor sharp treble hook onto that split ring. And I take that little tiny treble hook and I just hook it into the underside of that fluke. And then I tie another piece of fluorocarbon to that split ring and then run that down to another teeny tiny little razor sharp treble hook. And I put that hook into the back of the bait. So I have two extremely small razor sharp treble hooks then in that zoom fluke. Um, and that's what I'm using to target those fish. And even with that said, um, you know, like I'll have chances at maybe 10 fish, like I'll have 10 fish that strike the lure and I might hook two or maybe three of those fish. You know, a lot of times the, those hooks just do not find something to stick into in those gar. Um, yeah. like they're right on the surface. So I do it unweighted, you know, just the weight of the fluke is enough to cast it pretty well. And then it doesn't sink then either. You can keep it right up on the surface really easily. And like I said, you can bring it right past these fish and they'll come over and grab it. Yeah. Now everyone, you know, thinks when you think of gar, I think the first image that pops in the head is like the alligator gar, you know, oh, like yeah, monstrosity of an animal. And you're absolutely your, your first record was only a mere couple pounds, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the first fish that I have was uh, 2.35 pounds. So it was a relatively small fish. Yeah. Uh, and honestly, even for short nose gar which is what that record is for that's a average size fish at best probably okay. uh, you know it's one of those things like when you're looking through the record books you're looking at some of these things and you're like okay that's completely unbeatable that's never going to happen i would have to get struck by lightning before i could sure. ever catch a fish bigger than that uh, but looking through there the short nose gar record for indiana was so small that okay. even an average size fish was going to beat it so i made a specific trip to go target short nose gar and the very first one I caught weighed almost half again as much as what the current record was. So I just went ahead and certified it um, just for the heck of it, honestly. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it, it's a small fish. And honestly, in my opinion, it's still the most vulnerable record in the Indiana record books currently. You know, like, uh, some, of the, some of the surrounding states that have short nose guard, the records are like six pounds. Okay. And the one that I have is only like 2.35 pounds. So like I said, it's, it's definitely the most vulnerable still. Yeah, it also though something about it. It's it's a fish that not only doesn't get much press at all, if any, um, but it's also a fish that is not very common. You know, mm -hmm. um, I spend over a hundred days on the water, and I can't think of a specific time where I was like, "Oh, those are short nosed gar." You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying yeah. to think of the times I have, like you said, luckily hooked a gar because you'll feel them mm -hmm. swipe a lot. Um, where we mm -hmm. swim in Illinois a lot is on the rivers in the backwater and by like the warm water power plants, the discharge. Oh, yeah, also. absolutely. See a lot of gar in those areas, but normally it seems to be, you know, spotted, uh, but normally long nose gar. Mm -hmm. um, so I think finding that niche is something cool, you know, because you found the vulnerability in the list. You know, you, you looked for a record that could be beaten. Um, so good, good for you for searching that down, but then to get it, you know, pretty quickly is pretty cool too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of quickly, this one, it, it was like one of your first fish of the day, this last record, right? Yeah. So, um, so the short nose guard record was three years ago. And then since then, um, in my opinion, the second most vulnerable record in the record books was the spotted gar. So I was actually trying to set a new record for spotted gar. Um, I caught a couple of fish over the course of the years that I thought were pretty close. I actually had one that I had weighed at about seven pounds um, a few years back, but I was just not able to find a certified scale to have it weighed on at the time. Um, so I ended up actually releasing that fish back into the lake. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I've been actually searching for this record for a couple of years. I knew it was beatable. I knew that I just needed the right fish to be able to beat it. Um, so I went out fishing this evening. Um, really just, I mean, honestly, I just go fishing for fun, though. It's just kind of like a, sec a secondary thing. Like if I set a record, that's great. If not, I'll just have fun while I'm out. Sure. Um, but I, I started fishing this day. And I think before the record fish, I had one other chance at a fish. And again, you know, like I said, I hooked three out of 10 of them. Yeah. Um, missed that fish. And then just about 15 minutes later, I spotted this fish. And I'm like, wow, that's a really nice one. Made a cast to him. Uh, he just came right over and ate that fluke and I set the hook and I got him hooked really well. And uh, I got him close to the boat. I'm like, wow, he's even better than I think he is. 
And I fought them for just, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds. When I'm fishing for a gar, like I said, that's so hard to hook them. I'm just trying to get them in the boat pretty mm-hmm. quickly. I don't want to let them have a lot of chance to escape. Um, the longer you the longer you play with them, the more chances they have to come off like any other fish. Um, so I got them in the net pretty quick. And when I got them in the net, I'm like, wow, that is a really big fish. Um, so I, I was pretty certain right away that that was going to be the new Indiana State record. Um, so from there, I ended up taking them over to the bank. And uh, I had a, a little hand scale with me. Uh, so I took them over to the bank, got the fish out of the net, laid them on the laid them on the ground, put the net on the scale and took a tear weight um, so that it read zero with the net on there and then put the fish in the net and then held it back up. And it was nine pounds and eight ounces when I weighed it the first time. And I was looking at the number and I'm thinking there's no way that that's accurate. Like I messed something up, you know, I missed something like maybe the tear weight didn't work, something like that, because I was expecting it to be you know, seven and a half, maybe eight pounds. And uh, so I ended up taking the fish out of the net, turning the scale off, turning the scale back on, put the net back on it, did a tear weight again, put the fish back in it, held it up nine pounds, nine ounces. Like maybe it really is that big. Um, So I was was pretty shocked. And it ended up uh, by the time I got it weighed on a certified scale, um, you know, those little hand scales aren't hundred percent accurate. You know, the, the official weight ended up being nine pounds, 11 ounces. So it was even bigger than I, than I thought. But yeah, so it ended up being a really, really short fishing trip. You know, I fished for 20 minutes, caught this fish, and then uh, I spent about 15 minutes weighing it and messing around with it. And I'm like, all right, well, I have to find a certified scale now. And that was like basically the next task was getting it somewhere to get it weighed. You know, I knew even if it died and it lost a little bit of weight, it was still going to easily be big enough to to break the record. So like I said, that, that was what happened with the rest of the night was just trying to get it certified from then on. So I got to ask someone who's, you know, we're talking records today and we're, we're, we're transitioning right from the fishing to the hunting season. And this oh, is yeah. a perfect episode because you're hunting when you're looking for records, you are hunting kind of, you know, um, especially if you have a specific area in mind or, you know, for musky guys or bass guys, they know those fish don't move a whole lot. So they kind of stay in the same area, same body of water, you know, and hunt for that specific fish. Um, so my question is, he's, he's, you answered my first question was when you go out now, do you kind of have in mind where a scale is? I'd say no, because you said you spent all night looking for one. Where do you find certified scales? You know, I know some bait shops have them, maybe some grocery stores. You know, what do you look at? Who do you call? Yeah, so uh, so I'm I'm sitting on the bank that night with the fish in the net in the water. And I'm like, where am I going to go? It's like 7 p.m., where am I even going to find someplace? So I start, just started Googling places, um, looking for, like you mentioned, you know, grocery stores, meat markets, stuff like that, anywhere where they weigh something and then sell it to somebody. They have to have those certified by the Department of Weights and Measures to be able to, to sell whatever they're selling. Yeah. Um, but it was late enough that I wasn't going to be able to find any place like that to end up getting it certified. Um, luckily, I actually... I just started calling everybody that I knew, anybody that I'd ever talked to in the DNR, anybody that I knew that like had ever been involved in the fishing industry, just trying to find somebody who could get me in contact with a place to have it weighed. And I, uh, like I said, I put out a bunch of feelers and uh, I even messaged a couple people on Facebook Messenger, just trying to figure out who who I could take this fish to. And it ended up um, one of our Indiana DNR fish biologists, Ben Dickinson from Michigan City, replied to my Facebook message of all things and just said, Hey, uh, I'm putting the kids to bed. Give me like 30 minutes and I'll call you back. I'm like, okay, good deal. And, uh, about 45 minutes later, I'm like, oh, getting kind of anxious, hadn't heard anything. And then yeah. I ended up getting a phone, a phone call from a number that I didn't recognize. So I'm like, okay, this is probably going to be Ben. And I picked it up and it was actually our local Indiana DNR fish biologist from Northeast Indiana. Ben had gotten a hold of him and then he got in contact with me. So I ended up actually getting really lucky because uh, Tyler DeLauder is the guy's name. He he works out of Columbia City, which is only about 20 minutes from home for me. Yep. And he was like, oh, I'll, you know, give me 10 minutes and I'll meet you in the office. So I ended up uh, driving the fish over to Columbia City, which is, like I said, 20 minutes from here at about 9 p.m. then to have the fish weighed. And that worked out really well. You know, I got it weighed by a, a DNR fish biologist. So he verified the species, weighed the fish on a certified scale that they have in the office. They yeah. keep it specifically to try to weigh state records and other fish. 
And uh, that was the first fish that they had ever weighed as a record fish on that scale. So they were super excited about that too. You know, they, they all bought these scales and like very few of them had actually been able to weigh a new record fish on any of those scales. So he was really excited about it. Like I said, it just worked out beautifully for me to have him do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, part of our show is we start off and talk about records that are caught um, every, every, every other week. Right. So we, we handle every record that's caught and even, you know, I'm a little surprised on how many records we do get to go over, but to be fair, we are talking line class records. We're caught, we're talking state records, national records, world records. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of, you know, ways you can get a record if you really, if that's something that's super important to you, you know? Um, yeah. but when you come, when you talk about state records, I mean, the, the mass majority of records have stood for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, you know? So mm -hmm. when you, when you hear one, you know, it is, it is fun. And now to have two, the, the, <laughs> goal, the goal is to only wrap it up now, right? You got a long nose gar to catch. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, the long nose gar out of the three species is by far the biggest species of those gar. Um, our current state record is over 22 pounds. So that's significantly bigger than the spotted gar that I just caught. And uh, most of the long nose gar I've ever caught or even really seen would not be anywhere close to that 22 pound weight class. So uh, there's definitely going to be some research looking into that to see where do I go from here? You know, like, it seems like I'm going to have to take a trip somewhere to try to target them. You know, where I hear the biggest long nose gar live is in the lower Wabash River, the lower White River, and then into the Ohio River. So like kind of in the southern and western parts of the state. So it'll, it would take a trip for me to, to try actually target those fish and try to catch them. But yeah. you can believe that that's at least on my radar is something that I would like to do here at some point is, is try to go find a really big long nose gar you know, to try to challenge that last record. Just so no one thinks I'm lying, I have it written down right here. Wabash and Ohio River, tell Tom <laughs> that's where he has to go next to catch his yep. long nose gar. Um, Absolutely. It's like, all right, we got to help Kyle out here a little bit. We got to <laughs> research where we got to send him, you know? So, yeah, yeah. We, it seems to be some dams or, like I said, the warm water discharges on the Ohio, mm -hmm. it looks like, are known to hold some big ones. But, yeah, 20-pound-plus fish, you know, it is that's a big fish. That one might take yeah. a little digging. Oh, absolutely. Like I said, the fish I caught was 36 inches long. When you're getting to like the long nose gar, a fish in that class would be 55 inches or longer. It'd be very, very big. So it's it's doable just like anything else is. You know, mm -hmm. like uh even like you mentioned, you know, some of our records have stood for a very long time. Yeah. But even this year, we've proven that. So some of those records, even though you would think they're not beatable, absolutely are. You know, the smallmouth bass record was broken on Lake Monroe this spring with yeah. a smallmouth bass over eight pounds, which is just insane. I've never seen one even close to that size. You know, the biggest one I've ever handled personally was maybe five. And then uh, the yellow perch record was also broken this spring yeah. on Lake Michigan yep. with a, a perch over three pounds. Right so I mean, some of those records, good. some of those records stood for years and years and years, and you never would have thought those would have been broken, but Anything is possible. And that's what's great about fishing sometimes. I was, shout out to my mom. I was talking to her this morning, you know, and I said, I really think I understand why I'm addicted to fishing now. And she laughed and she said, oh, it only took you 30 some years to figure that out. And I said, no, no, no. You know, there's always been an answer for it. You know, that the tug is the drug um, just to be out in nature, you know, just to um, decompress and everything. But in reality, it's really just one word. And that's optimism. Th that's that's what fishing brings, you know, to me, at least um, knowing that. And I've never had a state record. I've never really chased one. Don't know if I've ever really come relatively close on one but knowing that any cast could be history for either you or the world um i think is really special and not knowing you know mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you know you that's one of those uh the main reasons why like i started a youtube channel is to record a lot of the things that i see while i'm out on the water you know because there's every time i'm out and it doesn't have to be anything important but there's always something really neat to see always something unique to see there's always some unique experience, um, you know, 
some of the, the best fish stories are the fish that don't get landed and you don't have pictures of, and you don't have anything to, to actually prove that it ever even happened. But a lot of the things that happen while I'm out now, I have on video, you know, oh, you wouldn't believe it. This muskie chased this lure right into my, into my feet and I hooked him and he jumped and he spit it out right away. And it was one of the biggest muskies I might have ever caught from my kayak. Yeah. Um, but you know, instead of that, just being a fish story and somebody gets to hear about it, they actually get to see some yeah. of those things too, which is really neat. You know, yeah. it's a great way to share, share with the people in my life. Some of the cool things that I experience while I'm on the water. Yeah. And if someone wants to check out what you're doing, where do they see your YouTube or your social media? Yeah. So, uh, really the, the mo place I'm most active is on YouTube and the channel name is Indiana kayak fishing journal. If you look for that, you'll find me, um, I've got over 300 videos on there. And then I have, uh, I'm a multi-species angler. I fish for anything and everything that there is um, all over the Northern part of the state, up into Michigan, over into Ohio. Um, so there's a lot of different content on there. And I have over 30 species of game fish that I've caught on my YouTube channel that I have on there. So like I said, a, wi a wide variety of stuff you can go and look at on there. Absolutely. Well, whether it's whether it's trout, salmon, or maybe we just want to catch a 30-pound drum, let's get together Northwest Indiana style one day. Absolutely. There's there's some big fish out there, no doubt, in the big pond. Mm -hmm. Well, Kyle, before I let you go real quick, you know, you, you, you brought it up real quick. You are a big kayak angler. I feel like we usually don't give enough attention to the kayak fishing. Um, especially here in Chicagoland, you know, you can't, uh, you don't always have room for a boat. You know, a lot of people are restricted. They don't have the money for a boat, can't store a boat. Um, one minute pitch on why someone should try kayak fishing or what's, what do you love about kayak fishing? So some of the best things about kayak fishing and the reason I got into it to begin with is it's extremely affordable to be able to get on the water. You know, buying a bass boat or even any kind of boat is going to cost you a lot more money than it will to even buy a pretty premium kayak. Some of the other things I like about it is uh, you don't need a boat ramp to get your kayak in the water. You know, you can launch almost anywhere you want to on almost any body of water you want to, as long as it's legal. Put that disclaimer in there. <laughs> um, like I said, you know, you can get into places that a lot of other people can't. You can access a lot of water that other people can't get to by foot or on a, a bigger boat. And then the other part of it that I just absolutely love is just feeling a lot more close to nature and the water itself. You know, you're physically a lot closer. You know, when I'm out kayak fishing, I can stick my hand down from the side of the kayak and run my hand through the water and the water's right there. And it really just has this magical, special ability to connect you with the water like no other way can. Um, the other thing, like I said, and I get asked this all the time, people are like, well, how can you catch big fish out of your kayak? You can catch anything you want to out of a kayak if you do it the right way. You know, I've caught everything from bluegills and crappies all the way up to muskies and king salmon and all of these great big species from my kayak. So the possibilities are endless when you're kayak fishing. It's just how far you want to take it. And then getting into it to begin with requires a lot less monetary investment and a lot less time. So that's what I would say is great about kayak fishing. That's that's well put. I recommend starting off maybe, you know, with the bluegill or the bass before you go to the billfish yeah. or sharks. You know? But people do it. Like you said, it's yeah. nice. I've seen every kayak fish pretty much landed these days. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it, it just the, the possibilities are really endless with it. You know, it gets you on any body of water you want, really, under the right conditions. You know, like I've been on Lake Michigan in my kayak quite a bit. So, I mean, it's the, really the possibilities are completely endless with the kayak fishing as long as you pay attention to the weather um, and the waves and all that kind of stuff, you know, the forecast for it. Be smart, wear a life jacket, and check out Old Town Kayaks. That That is definitely one thing that not a lot of people think about. Make sure you get a good life jacket before you go out. That That is a great ad. You know, a lot of people don't think about it at all. Anything can happen while you're on the water. You need to be safe while you're out there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, hey, Kyle, I want to congratulate you one last time. Um, cheers. You know, I hope uh, I hope you get that one on the wall. That is a question real quick. I saw I saw you have a mount of your first state record, right? Yep, I do. Do they does the state get that for you? I've always wondered. No, no. no. <laughs> yeah. And uh, doing a fish mount like here now is like $15 an inch. So they don't come cheap either. You know, the, the new fish is 36 inches long, so it's going to cost a little bit of money to get it mounted for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Well, hey, uh, congrats on everything. And um, we'll work on, uh, I know we didn't add to the story, but we'll work on getting you out of rod. I heard you broke your rod on your last state yeah, record. I did. Well, so. Yeah, I, I broke about three inches of the, the tip of my rod off. I That's the first time that's actually ever happened to me. And I've been fishing my entire life and I've never broken a rod like that. So it, it kind of just adds to the story too. Yeah, I broke I broke my rod catching this the state record gar. Um, I ended so up being, it broke my rod. <laughs> I I think honestly I did I just did something stupid. I got it in the net with not enough line out, and it just when the fish started going crazy in the net, it ended up breaking it. Is is what I think. Um, but I, I ended up I actually just uh, took a lighter, took the rod tip or the the last you know the rod guide off the top of the rod. And then actually just put it back on three inches down and it works fine. It looks a little goofy. It's a little shorter than some of my other rods now, but, but yeah, <laughs> it actually did break my rod. But like I said, I think it was mostly my fault. Well, either way, Kyle, it sounds like you're, you're a great fisherman and probably a better person for a rod sponsor than I am. You know, you catch state records. I don't, I break three to five rods a year. You, uh, <laughs> you don't break any and fix the ones you do break. So, Hey, cheers to you. <laughs> Kyle, we'll see you later. Thanks for joining us on the show this week. Yep. Thanks for having me, Jim. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Kyle, for joining us. Well, I love hearing about catching a fish that I don't know much about and that's not mainstream, but still, I can see the hunt, I can see the passion, and it makes gar fishing a lot cooler. So, hope you get that third record any day now. But hey guys, we're gonna take a quick commercial break real quick, but don't go anywhere because we are going to literally dive into the world of spear fishing and a recent record. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. everyone well hey you know it's one of my favorite times when we get to actually join one of our record setters that we are talking about on the show and not only that you know it is a perfect transition from fishing the hunting season fishing and hunting underwater and we have an expert on the subject Britt Liebel. Brett how you doing? Hey Jim I'm doing well appreciate the uh Kind words, experts a little, you know, much for me maybe, but I appreciate that. Well, maybe so, but hey, when it comes to freshwater spearfishing, especially in America, it's it's still a pretty tight-knit group. It's pr pretty niche -y still. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, we, we always kind of joke that we're, we're the, the small community that sort of is really good at advertising, but we're, we're hoping we're making some waves in, into the uh, fishing mainstream. Yeah. And, um, you know, before we get into your record, Carp, you know, um, I just found out when we started this conversation here um, that, or, or sorry, see, my brain's messing up because I'm thinking mm -hmm. record Carp. But I'm looking at record starp, you know, which I've never even heard of. And I thought I knew everything when it came to uh, freshwater fish in, in America. Here. But those starp behind you, they're uh, those are some incredible looking starp, you know. Yes, thank you. Uh, that's a, a very new record of ours. That's myself and Big Jake Lords at the uh, World Freshwater Spearfishing Championship 2021 in Beaver Lake, Arkansas. Got those bad boys. I think oh, about 38 feet or so. We pulled them up. Yeah, you know, some starp. There you go. To anyone that doesn't know, the Starp is a finely crafted, painted common carp to look like a striped bass. Um, so all jokes aside, no record there. But we did just recently out west um, shoot a record lake trout, correct? Yes, sir. Yep. We were 
fortunate to be able to do it. We've been chasing this record now uh, three years with the pole spear. And okay. so, yeah, this record is three years in the making and um, it's a pretty niche accomplishment, I would say. Absolutely. Now, you know, you did it out in Wyoming or Montana? Uh, Wyoming, yep. Wyoming, yeah. And, you know, when I think of glacier lakes, mountain lakes, when I think of lake trout, I'm like, how can someone free dive that deep, right? Um, what is what is something that, you know, maybe people don't understand about the sport? Um, or do you have iron lungs? How do you, how does one, you know, carp, I get it, right? They're surface feeders often. They, they like the shallow water. Um, when it comes to some of these other species, how does, how does one do such a thing? Sure. Um, you know, there, there's no mystery to it. It's, uh, spearfishing is a pretty old method of take, right? And the Hawaiians are some of the best at it in the United States. Um, those guys dive deep and long, um, but in freshwater, you know, it's quite a bit colder. It's quite a bit darker. There's quite a bit of, uh, differences to, prohibit uh, people from wanting to do it right but right. if you got, if you got the love and you don't live by the ocean man you got to dive those freshwater lakes so um yeah just you know practice and passion and that's about it and uh you know i can take a guy who's passionate and and new and doesn't matter if you're a world-class athlete or an old man like myself you can uh put some technique together and some proper equipment and and bam you're in there having a great time what is because i mean I, I i know there's a lot of you know challenges to get into a new sport especially as complex as this um but what what are some of the um kind of safety you know safety instructions or advice you have to give people and also maybe a little advice on how to how to expand the time you can spend underwater and such like that sure sure yeah like you know, the most common question people ask is like, well, how deep do you go and how long can you hold your breath? Right. Those are the two big questions. And and the deepest I've ever shot a fish was just over 93 feet. Um, and that was in Mexico, not in freshwater, but 93 feet is my deepest trigger pull. And then uh, my longest breath hold underwater was two and a half minutes. Now that doesn't mean um, I'm going to shoot a fish because I'm down there for two and a half minutes. In fact, I just posted to my Instagram story, um, my, uh, a striper I just got this weekend, uh, was, I was down, uh, down, shot the fish, secured the fish and brought them to the surface in 51 seconds. Wow. So that's a, you know, a decent little drop, uh, to, to 40 feet, shot a nice striper, secured and brought them back. An unsuccessful dive was a minute 44. And that's where I laid on the bottom. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And the takeaway here is the successful dives happen pretty quick. It's the unsuccessful ones where you're waiting. So, you know, you don't have to have iron lungs. You don't have to dive super deep, you know, like it's going to happen or it's not. And don't beat yourself up if you don't have a huge breath hold, bottom line. Sure, sure. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to safety, right, I feel like when anything, experimenting with anything new, um, especially once you're out of your environment, you know, when you, when you lose oxygen, you know, you're a little bit out of your environment, space and underwater for exactly. humans, you know, a little different. Um, obviously I'm not even, um, a spear fisherman, but I know that you probably always want to dive with someone, right? That's. That was exactly right. The first thing, you know, I know you asked me kind of a, a multifaceted three-part question back there yeah. and, um, Number one thing for safety is dive with a partner. You know, if you can dive with somebody who's more experienced, even better. But look, I started, like I grew up in southeastern Wisconsin, um, diving the Great Lakes, diving the local area lakes. And, you know, just like anyone, just didn't know what I was doing. But I had a group of friends that enjoyed hunting and we enjoyed fishing. So, of course, we're going to love the spearfish, right? It's hunting underwater. And uh, went down to my buddy's dad. Uh, had a, a you know bunch of gear and storage old stuff whatever and we just grabbed whatever and I mean we had no wetsuits we just were bare bones high school kids going yeah. out into Lake Michigan just stick and purge man and and had a blast and had a lot of great fish fries and I feel like the girls in college really appreciated our manliness and you know as we progressed in the sport we we had uh, some fanfare from it and 
you know, just being with those humble roots of growing up in Wisconsin and getting into spearfishing and, and doing it, you know, just learning as you go. I would say the number one thing to progressing quickly is having a decent dive partner or decent knowledgeable buddy. Nowadays, there's classes. I mean, this is 25 years ago I started, but but now YouTube classes, like there's so many ways to people to fast track their way to success. Yeah. Well, and and not only that, you know, you you look at obviously America in a whole is is fairly young compared to the rest of the world, right? Um, but you look at you you look at some of these other countries, Portugal and uh, some other European countries and some South American countries. Spearfishing is not niche; it's not new. Um, it might still be smaller than regular fishing or some other outdoor activities, but um, I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of years in some places. If that is that being a way to um, little on the sport side, but harvesting, you know fresh seafood and in, in seafood dominant coastal areas. For sure. And the, the part about it is we actually, you know, as opposed to hook and line, we actually select the individual fish we are going to harvest. Right. I mean, if you're, you know, like me, you grew up hardcore walleye fishing with my dad and, and, you know, before electronics were really good and, and before we had all the techniques and we, we would just watch this Midwest outdoors magazine or TV show where we would just try to learn from what we're seeing and, and following guys like Al Linder around. And, and, you know, we would wade through bunches of small fish. I don't think I caught, I don't think I ever until I went up to Canada a few years ago, caught a fish over like 22 inches. Right. But when I'm spearfishing, I can literally pick out a walleye that's, you know, the perfect 22 inch, you know, or the perfect 18 or actually in Utah, the walleyes, um, they, they want us to target the smaller walleyes. Mm -hmm. And so we work with the DNR closely and we pick out, you know, 15 inch and under fish because that's what they target for their multi-species management plants. Which, by the way, those 12 to 15 inchers, I mean, they are so tasty. Um, everyone gives me flack about if I say a perch is the best tasting fish, you know, they're like, how can you say that when there's wall? I'm like, hey, listen, same family. Same family. Yeah. I just feel like it's more delicate when it's smaller and thinner, you know, but you can get that kind of fillet if you take smaller walleye. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, that's, that's the thing. Um, you know, we, we work with the game fish, marine biologists, game managers of the area. And they, we target literally what they, what they ask us to, we're, we're not competing against fishermen. We're another tool in the toolbox, right? We're not, you know, some of the, the flack we get is like, oh, why you're out there going to shoot all those breeder walleyes or whatever. And it's like, well, we'll shoot exactly what's legal and what uh, we work with the local people with, especially in our tournaments, with what their goals are. And, and we try to dovetail into that. So. No, and that's a great point. You know, um, I mean. I think anytime there's something new, right, there's pushback. No one likes a lot of people don't like change. Right. Um and especially people who make money off of it, like we've talked to on the side before that sometimes, you know, charter captains or someone, you know, can get maybe a little a little picky about this, a little upset. But in reality, here's the deal, right? Let's let's talk about walleye for a second. And right now we're not shooting walleye in Wisconsin yet, but maybe one day. Um, but you talk about the walleye run in the spring and you've got all these rivers where just thousands of pregnant females are coming in. And luckily, during that season, right, they limit what you can keep, right? They kind of protect the fishery a little bit. However, you're still allowed one over, I believe, 29 inches. And on all four or five of these rivers, I mean, there's hundreds of people every day for two months. Um, and I'm not even that worried about the ones that they are keeping, the once in a blue moon, the 29 or 30, 31 they're keeping, you know. It's when they're all bottlenecked like that you're running, people are running troubles into fish's backs, you know, they're snagging them on accident. Um, you know, you're, you're catching 20, 30 a day. So they're, you're getting, you're handling a lot more fish, possible disease on their scales, you know, wounds, sores, uh, you gill hook a fish. So yes, maybe you're not a catch and release angler. So or let's say someone is a catch and release angler, right? there's still going to be fish that are dying from disease, from lack of slime coat. If you dropped them on their head, if you'd gill hook them, 
where you guys, you're only going to take your your limit max. And, and again, probably not a lot of Spiros probably don't even do that because, you know, if you are in a plentiful or rich area, you don't have to stock the freezer because you'll know you know when you can go get more food because you can go select it like a grocery mm -hmm. store. Yeah, I was just going to say, man, it's grocery shopping at, at a certain point. And, you know, we have that ability and but we're not a very large number of people either. Right. Like you're talking about just raw numbers, the numbers game and, and using that with the, the walleye fishery. Michigan's done a really good um, you know, study on it. This was the last uh, the last few years has been a study period where they've made every spear fisherman report their harvest, their, report their time in the water, et cetera. And I think they took uh, 475 total fish last year out of the fishery in Michigan with, you know, a couple hundred divers that that um, got the endorsement for spearfishing. Yeah. And those guys, you know, spent hundreds of hours in the water. So they're, they're really, you talk about the walleye fishery in Michigan and the charter captains and everybody that go into that as part of a, a livelihood, they took over a million pounds of fish. So, you know, the spear fisherman is less than, took less than a 10th of 1% of that total harvest, right? We're really not anybody who's out there to do significant damage to the fishery, but we provide uh, real feedback, you know, and I've learned so much about fishing and, and how to fish and where and what time and man sometimes if my dad was just befuddled he'd be he'd be fishing and just can't catch it get a walleye to bite and, ah, it's summertime you know this is northern wisconsin we have a cabin he's like ah it's northern you know it's summer it's the, the fish are in 30 feet of water well i jump in the put my mask on jump in the boat you know jump off the boat dive down to 30 feet man it's a dead zone there's nothing down there we go back in it's eight feet of water weeds and uh, there's the walleyes sleeping on the bottom in the weeds. They're just asleep middle of the day. They're they're just not biting. They're only activated during that early, you know, whatever, yeah, you know, hour uh, or half hour of sunrise and sunset. And and the rest of the time, man, they're just they're in eight feet of water, hiding out, sleeping. Imagine. Yeah, I mean, it, so for someone who hasn't spearfished, you know, yet, um, that is that is something that really captivates my imagination. Is I, I, I'm a fisherman my whole life, right? And um, more than that, I'm a nature lover. I'm a I'm an animal lover, fish lover. Um, and I just want to explore that world. You know, I think um, right now we talk so much about live scope, how, what it shows us underwater, you know, and 10, 15 years ago, the aqua view was like, oh my God, yeah. I have a camera <laughs> down there. Um and that, those are great. Those are great tools. I will utilize them all the time. But could you imagine if you just every time you just wanted to go take a look and see what's down there? And obviously, you know, you might spook your fish that day. But if you can, if you are a bass tournament fisherman and you also spearfish, you know, if let's say you fish for carp, you spearfish carp, right? So not only are you helping out your lake and getting rid of some invasive species and getting rid of some of those uh, fish that are going to eat your bass eggs, but now you're going to see where those bass are hanging out better than you've ever, ever have. And, you know, you might be able to see what they're eating or where they're staging or hiding. And I mean, if, if you don't see the value in that, then you're missing out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you're exactly right. More often than not, I'm a nature observer. And when I, when I come back into Wisconsin and, you know, my, my parents still live there, my mother still lives there, my sister still lives there in Kenosha. When I come back and, and I get in the water with my nephews and we go diving, we can only spear uh, panfish and roughfish and and bullheads and uh, actually bowfin or dogfish. So that's all we can really spear, which leaves you a lot of free time to check out everything else. And I've seen some amazing big muskies. I've seen some amazing big bass. I mean, giant, what's looked like 10 pound bass, maybe they're eight or five, but yeah. And, and, um, my understanding of the underwater world is it grown ex exponentially from that experience, right? And, and then how do I know how do I relay that as a fisherman? Well, I become more patient. You know, I, I realize that these fish are only feeding when they really want to. Yeah, you say spook them. Well, as a spear fisherman, when I see them spook, they don't go far, and then they come right back. Like I watch them, I chase them off of a bed, or I chase them off of a little bit of structure that they call home. 
and I swim around and two minutes later I come back and they're right there. So, so they didn't go anywhere, but now maybe they developed lockjaw, right? Maybe that presentation, if I'm throwing a bait, isn't right. They don't want to bite it, but maybe now I have to irritate them, right? Or maybe now I have to just keep switching it up, trying different techniques or trying different time of day or trying, you know, something different. Like that's, that's my understanding. So I'm, uh, you know, what would you, is it more like hunting or is it more like fishing? What do you feel like you're doing? Or is it truly a hybrid? Man, it is. Or nothing. Is it? It's, I'm, it's yeah, right. It's, it's nothing like in the world. No, I would say it's like, it's like, it's like 50, 50, I was going to say 60, 40 hunting, but it's 50, 50. Cause if you, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of water where the fish aren't. You know what I mean? Sure. I think that's kind of a common saying, right? Like 90% of the fish live in 10% of the water. Like that's totally true. Sure. So once you've used your fish brain, uh, you used your fishing fisherman skills to narrow down where the fish are, then you're in the water and then you're hunting them. And, and hunting them is not like tree stand hunting, which is how I grew up in Wisconsin. It's more like spot and stalk or, or a combination. And actually, it's I, like I say that pickup truck and drive around and find them and then you know, a little a little found <laughs> upon in the hunting world but yeah yeah c- certainly some of that but there is a bit of there is a bit of um tree sand hunting so um you know striper striper diving that i was doing this last week you know we dive down just below the thermocline so my you know my whole body is in the thermocline um and the stripers you just lay there and wait and the stripers come to you so I don't, I can't, cause they're like almost, I call it like a striper, almost like a pelagic. They're just constantly on the hunt, constantly on the move. You know what I'm saying? They're not, yeah, there's certain structure that they relate to. They relate to structure, but they're not hanging out there like a walleye. Yeah. More yeah. chasing balls of bait out there and roaming. Yeah. And we saw that I got bait. So I got surrounded in a bait ball. So freshwater bait balls are super cool to be a part of. Um, and these striper packs are out just, you know, corralling the bait, chasing them around, hunting them up, pushing them up to the surface where they can slurp on them on the, on the surface, or they're pushing them against structure where they can attack them and dart in, dart out. So, you know, that's a lot of more like tree stand hunting, dive in in an area that that you know, they'll be and wait. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I just have some general questions, you know, on spear fishing and hopefully educate the viewers, right. With a lot of this, um, so I want to start with some of the basics. Okay. So, um, what I've seen so far and just add on to it, right. So equipment wise, you have, um, you have a suit if you need it. Right. Or you can go without, I guess. Right. So yeah, exactly. Right? We, we, I went out with, without a suit for so many years in Wisconsin. I didn't, couldn't afford one as a kid. Yeah. Then you have free diving or tank diving. Right. So it kind of differentiates a lot with gear there. Yep. And, and the, I've started out, uh, tank diving because my friend's dad had a scuba shop and we got certified and did all that. But honestly, I haven't touched a tank in 25 years because, you know, it's so much less BS just to like jump in the water, throw a mask and snorkel on and swim. Yeah. Yeah. Less sound to scare the fish away, less equipment on you, holding you back we talk about that and the the sound is interesting sometimes i think the stripers come to the sound mm. sometimes i think they don't they're put off by the sound sure. sometimes sometimes the walleyes come to the sound the bubbles sometimes the walleyes are put off so it's it, that's kind of into that fish dependent um you know but generally free diving is silent you know i'm holding my breath underwater there's no bubbles you know i'm just waiting and i try to envision myself as a piece of garbage or something that's fallen off a boat right that just sinks down to the bottom and and i just kind of relate to the bottom i I lay down there and i think happy thoughts i don't want to be up have a predator mindset where my head's darting around looking i want to be still i want to think you know the fish to think i'm just another piece of garbage that's fallen off the the boat or or whatever that they want to come check out well brett don't worry we we view you as you as more than garbage (laughs) that's a good that's a good one um (laughs) So, all right. So you get in the water. Yeah. And then one of the things I am really curious about is I've seen so different 
I've seen many different um, style guns, different methods of, you know, shooting a fish. What um, can you walk us through a little bit of your options there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, as you know, like any piece of sporting equipment, the options are nearly limited. And sometimes I think they're designed to catch the sportsman more than the fish, right? Like, of course, of course. you ever see it? Uh, exactly. Exactly. So this one, um, this one right here, you can't tell me that's made more to catch a, a person than a fisherman. I mean, we got a double fish in there, a fish eating a fish. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's a bit of, black magic let's say than hard science right but you know a very basic setup is a pole spear and that's what i shot my world record um lake trout with in june and that's literally a, a pole that ranges in, in length from you know uh four foot for really you know close encounters to you know i've got a pole for uh, blue water uh, ocean fish that's 11 feet long oh, wow. and on the end of that pole is attached a, a simple like uh rubber band, similar to what you'd see in like the exercise rubber workout rubber bands. Sure. And that's attached to the back and you slip your hand in the, in the loop that's formed by the rubber band and, and kind of cock that spear back, which tensions the rubber band and propels it forward when you, re when you release your grip. That's a very basic setup called a, a pole spear. And then you're, you're, you know, that's where I started. And that's all I used in Wisconsin until I basically moved out for, uh, after college and, and got into ocean fishing and then, you know, next level, uh, freshwater diving which is what i'm doing now and then and that's where those next levels is where you start getting into the guns right and there's very basic guns that's it's it looks like a spear gun you saw james bond have in the 60s not much has really changed mm -hmm. um two two rubber bands uh attached to the muzzle that you, you you use your human strength to pull back and and loop the the band over a, a, a like a loading tab where the the band hooks to on the spear and the trigger mechanism, when you pull the trigger, it, it releases the spear uh, from the, the gun and the rubber band propels it forward in, into the fish, right? Mm -hmm. So you can get as crazy on that as you want. There's three or four thousand dollar Italian made uh, guns. And then there's very basic made in USA stuff that's, you know, 100, 150, 150 bucks. And it's a great setup. And I just bought my wife. Uh, that very setup to use at the uh, freshwater national. She'll be my dive partner and she's, you know, only dove a handful of times, but she's going to dive with me at the national tournament in Lake Geneva. That's awesome. And um, yeah, so it's, believe it or not, on the contrary of, you know, something like um, bow fishing, that's usually costs hundreds of dollars or, um, you know, fly fishing, musky fishermen, people look at getting into something more niche, but like, it seems like there's always thousands of dollars involved, you know? Um, this seems like maybe you could pretty much have a whole setup for under 500 bucks and get going, huh? Oh, easily. And, and another cool thing is, uh, so I'm on the national freshwater spearfishing association. I'm one of the board members, there's seven of us. Yeah. And one of our other board members, uh, started this year, like a gear rental program, just Ooh. like how the old Netflix, remember the old Netflix, you would, uh, internet order what you wanted for movies and then they would mail them to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's almost like yeah. this thing called Blockbuster. I know you kids have never heard of it, but Blockbuster yeah. was sick. Blockbuster was sick. And then um, then next level was the Netflix mail order your movies. And yeah. now it's all streaming. But uh, yeah. we can't we can't stream fishing gear to you. But you can mail order rent and rent by mail um, fishing gear. And it's called Versa Spear. It's a little rental program to let people kind of try it before they buy it, if that's a, a good analogy. But if you want it, if you're like, dude, I know this is me. I like to fish. I like to hunt. Of course, I'm going to like to hunt fish. Um, if that's the case, you know, get on to one of, uh, I mean, even Amazon has stuff, right? But get on to um, Google, the Google machine and Google up, uh, you know, spear guns or whatever. And you'll get websites like Mako Spear Fishing will come up. Red Tide Spear Fishing will come up. Um, spear America. There's all kinds of shops that are happy to sell you internet-based products. and there's reviews, there's stuff, you know, you can always, you know, get on, on social media and find somebody that's doing it and just ask them, like, we're happy to talk about it. We're, we're not as, we're not as weird as, as CrossFit, but if you get on, you know, you get on a spear fisherman, we're going to talk at you. Yeah. Now, Brett, um, you know, before we go here in a minute, we are planning, we're going to, we're going to film a whole show in person together, you know, and get some underwater footage for everyone. So look forward to that guys. 
Um, but you want to talk about that event a little bit coming up because it's it's especially important here to our Midwest people. Yeah, so this is this is really special to me too. Thanks for the opportunity, Jim, to, to speak about this. So we the National Freshwater Spearfishing Tournament, um, we typically you know, rotated around uh, different lakes in the United States. And it's always been in the West to, to you know, Arkansas is as close as we've come to the Midwest. And um, this year I said, guys, I know a great lake in Southeastern Wisconsin, super easy, fly into Chicago, fly into Milwaukee, um, shore dive. So uh, no boats are allowed for the tournament day. You literally get in the water at the seven public access points on, in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And we have a program set up for, you know, really beginner spear fishermen to be successful and have a chance to like really win mm-hmm. um, where we're chasing, chasing rock bass. So we're going to allow competitors to shoot 20 rock bass and 10 carp and be weighed and, you know, you know, compete with the big boys, guys coming in from Hawaii, guys coming in from, uh, Florida and California that are like the big boys. But I, I mean, I know some good old fashioned Michiganders or some good old Wisconsinites are going to come down there, maybe some cut off blue jeans and they're going to jump in with a mask and a snorkel and they're going to spear up a, a record and a number of fish. And, and uh, it's going to be fun to put the heat on these big, big guys. Is our boy Jake going to be there? Our boy Jake will be there. And the person I call him the king of freshwater or cough for short. And uh, he he's a, a great advocate uh, for the sport. He's he's really helped us, you know, gain a toehold and, and get some of that social media fame. But man, we're gonna have so many big names from uh, athletes of the year like uh, Richie Zacker out of Florida, um, Justin Lee. You know, if you if you follow spearfishing at all, these guys are big. Uh, Ryan Myers has a huge following on social media as well. I think we get Lauren Sarasua coming up from Miami. You know, a lot of these big, big names in the saltwater game, but they're going to come to Wisconsin and they're going to see what it's like to just jump in a lake and uh, and do what I did as a kid growing up and, and grew up there. And, and like I said, starting in high school, we that was my stomping ground. So I'm bringing it home. Um, it's going to be a great uh, banquet where anybody's invited to come check it out at Casey's Cabin. You know, that's Friday night, 6 p.m. is the awards banquet. It's, there's raffles. If you want to try to win some gear, you don't even want to have to buy it. Just go and enter wow. our raffles and win. Absolutely. Yeah, Casey's Cabin on, on Friday, September 27th, 6 p.m. is the awards. The weigh-in and the awards are all held right there. So that'll be that'll be really cool too, to, to, to meet everybody, you know, meet and greet, and uh, just, you know, talk spear fishing and fishing. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm sure some people will stick around. Um, I think Saturday, I think we're going to have the largest rock bass fish fry of all time. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to we're going to put them down. Um, we, we also Saturday actually have a juniors tournament. So we call we're calling it Jaws and we're going to uh, let the kids. My son, he's six. He'll be competing with his mother. She's she's going to you know, it's going to be kind of fun. She's going to take him and, and keep him safe, of course. And, uh, you know, they can the kids can pick on all the different species. So they, they're after perch, bluegills, crappies, as well as the rock bass. And then um, I'll dive with my I'll dive with my nephew, my sister's uh, youngest boy. And um, yeah, we're going to have fun and then put together a big fish fry, of course, Saturday afternoon. But uh, looking forward to that as well. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, you're going to turn some heads. You're going to turn some heads with how big of rock bass and crappie that are going to come out of that lake because they're yeah. some very big ones. Oh yeah. So if we, I was there in July scouting. We, we did a, like a little promo video, which, you know, you can find on our website um, and, and whatever, but yeah, the underwater uh, biomass, let's say of that lake is insane. Just the amount of fish that are living in one body of water. It's like, uh, it's like a Jurassic Park, man, for lack of better words. I can't wait for those Florida boys to be like, that is a strange, scary looking barracuda right there. <laughs> you know, there's some, I mean, there's some 50 inch fish in that lake, you know? A, a 50 incher uh, has been spotted twice, once uh, by a Utah uh, guy that was out um, scouting and once by a Floridian. Yeah. So they exactly right. They saw that and they were like, what the heck is this thing doing? Muscalunge to anyone that isn't following along, not Barracuda. <laughs> yeah, Essox Muscanangi, if you're uh, into the Latin. 
There you go. There you go. The whole ESOX family. You know, they, there's some big old pike out there, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, Brett, um, if people want to check you out, um, we'll we'll leave the link to the website here. But um, you got social media, too. Where should people look at all that stuff? Yeah, I appreciate that, Jim. I'm I'm uh, uh, online myself on Instagram uh, at the real Brett Liebel. And then the National Freshwater Spirit Fishing Association is uh, online as well. Instagram and Facebook. Uh, National Freshwater Spearfishing Association. So you guys uh, can follow along there and um, our website's the same. So, you, you know, we're, we're trying our best to be found. I hope you find us if you want, even if you want to, you know, spit hate, you know, come into the comments, DM, do whatever you got to do. Mm-hmm. Tell us uh, how bad we are for the fishery. You know, the you can't be any worse in the Midwest than the uh, the the western wyoming uh lake trout people are you know they they think we're just out there just killing everything that you know it's theirs it's not anybody else's but yeah i'm I'm ready to take on all comers i'm not afraid at the end of the day i understand it's a small sample size you know and and spear fishing is fairly new to michigan but like you said they took what's equivalent and this is no hate on anyone everyone's doing their job we love guides and we love captains you know but for a whole year, the divers took as much as one port will take in a Saturday of guiding for the walleye trolling. So, yeah, I, I don't think you have any uh, gripes with me here, um, but I look forward to seeing this sport grow. And, uh, Brett, before I let you go, I guess we'll tell you and everyone that if you guys do want to come compete in the event or just come watch, I am going to compete. Jim O'Neill is going to take his bass fishing world, forget it, and I am going to compete in my first ever national championship for spear fishing. And you're right, guys. What do I know about spear fishing? Absolutely nothing. So if I shoot myself in the foot, it'll be entertaining. Or if I somehow, by the grace of God, get a plaque, you know, we'll be we'll be hooting and hollering all night long. That's that's the goal, Jim. We want you and everyone else to to join us and have fun. Uh, we're we're not bad people. We we all started out fishing. We all started out, you know, not knowing anything and baiting worms. I was just talking the other day about biting uh, lead sinkers with my teeth as a kid. You know, I I might have lead brain. Maybe that's what's got me out here spear fishing now. But uh, it's great, man. It's a lot of fun. We're we're not the evil boogeyman, but if you think we are, you know, come come find us anywhere you want and holler, scream, yell, talk to us. We're uh, we're happy to, to have that conversation and we're happy to try to get more uh, people involved and just get a better respect and a better understanding of what's going on there underneath the water. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Well, hey, this is Brett. Again, we want to say congratulations to your big uh, scarp. I mean, um, your trout, you know, <laughs> your record trout, you know, but uh, no, Thanks. Brett, thank you for joining us, Brett. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Awesome, Jim. Thanks so much for the time. Appreciate you guys all. Hey, thanks, Brett. I really love learning about all these new ways of catching fish, you know, and spear fishing, really. This is fascinating to me. The underwater world is what we love so much, but we know it from the top side view. So to be able to get into the fish environment, to learn more about them, and like Brett talked about, selective harvest if you're going to keep some fish, I think it's important for the future of fishing and a sport and an activity that you can get involved with if you're looking to expand your outdoor reach. Now, we're gonna take a quick commercial break, but we're going to be right back and talk about something that caught some more big fish. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com.
Welcome back, everyone. Hey, I got a bait here. Let's talk about it real quick. Although it wasn't a state record, scrolling through the social medias last week, I saw one of the most impressive fish I have ever seen in my life, and that was a nine pound smallmouth just caught right outside of the Green Bay Harbor in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And a fish that big right here in the Midwest, I gotta talk about it. You know what else? It was caught on this guy right here, the Chapo by Berkeley. Um, I think ever since the inception of the Whopper Plopper, you know, top water style baits like this have been pretty sought after. Um, a buzzbait has always been one of my favorite baits, but the problem with the buzzbait, right, is the second you stop reeling that, that bait becomes useless and sinks to the bottom, where the nice thing about the Chapo is it stays floating. Um, quite a different pitch on the sound of it and you can work at different speeds you know you can go for a slow retrieve and that'll just plop um, over that back kicker or you can race it and you can really hear that thing churn in water so really cool bait obviously it catches big fish now you'll see here in this video of my good friend Larry Ladowski he was up in Saskatchewan this past week fishing for big pike and unlike a buzz bait you can see this bait stopping to trigger the bite of a big 40 inch plus pike that was waiting for a big meal. So whether you guys want to catch some big toothy critters this year or close to a state record bass, check out the Chapo and the other Berkeley products at berkeleyfishing.com. Well, everyone, just like that, unfortunately it is time that we end the show. As always, I want to thank Fish Daddy for making this possible. I want to thank you guys, the viewers, for being here. And hey, if you're watching, want to thank you guys. Make sure to like and subscribe. And remember, you can always take us with you in the car or at your workout and listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And little news update, Bassmaster stop number seven of the opens is postponed due to wind. So we'll take a little more time until we find out what's going on there up in Leech Lake, one of the best fisheries here in the Midwest. Until next time guys, I'm Jim O'Neill and we will see you guys on the water.